This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning and welcome to chapel. Our speaker this morning is Dr. T. Gatewood, who is the pastor of Arbordale Presbyterian Church in Banner Elk, uh, North Carolina. He may be becoming a familiar face to some of you. We're glad to have him back after having him here early last semester. Oh, come. Let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the sheep of his pasture, the people of his hand. Let us worship God. Our opening hymn is number 401. If you would please take your hymnals and stand and sing 401. Here in this place, your new light is streaming. Now is the darkness vanished away. See in this space, our dreams, our dreamings, brought here to you in the light this day. Gather us in the lost and forsaken. Gather us in the blind and the lame. Call to us now and we shall awaken, we shall arise at the sound of our name. We are the young, our lives are a mystery, we are the old who yearn for your face. We have been sung throughout all of history, call to be light to the whole human race. Gather us in the rich and the haughty, gather us in the proud and the strong. Give us a heart so meek and so lowly, give us the courage to enter song. Here we will take the wine and the water, here we will take the bread of new birth. Here you shall call your sons and your daughters, call us anew to be sought for the earth. Give us to drink the wine of compassion, give us to eat the bread that is you. Nourish us well and teach us to fashion lives that are holy and hearts that are true. Not in the dark of buildings confining, not in some heaven light years away. Here in this place the new light is shining, now is the kingdom and now is the day. Gather us in and hold us forever. Gather us in and make us your own. Gather us in, all people together. Fire of love in our flesh and our bone. You may be seated. Trusting in God's mercy, let us join together in confessing our sin. Jesus, friend and brother, you taught us to abide in your generous love. 
We believe that your love completes our lives. as you have loved us, for love brings your creation to fruition. We struggle to love the people in our lives, as you have loved us. We fail to remain in you and let your word remain in us. Forgive us, we pray, and teach us to receive and return your love again. Amen. Long ago, Jesus said to his disciples, I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. Jesus speaks these words to us today. He chooses us to be his friends and forgives us for our sins, even as he sends us out to share in his great work of love. Hallelujah. It's good to be back with you guys. Always fun to drive to Bristol, uh, to come here and to see the campus. I saw the baseball team out wrapping it up this morning. I saw some of you guys walking in. Um, and uh, it's exciting for me to see that and to be here uh, with you. I want to get started this morning by telling you a short story and making a really small confession. Um, there is a Presbyterian evangelist named Ray Jones. Now, for some of you, Presbyterian evangelist sounds like an oxymoron, frozen chosen, going out to share the faith. Nevertheless, Ray Jones is a great um, speaker. He's a great preacher. He's a great teacher. Um, and I heard him tell a story one time of going to Pittsburgh. He went to a church called the Hot Metal Bridge. Uh, a church literally under a bridge that meets in a tattoo parlor. Uh, and he was there two weeks in a row, uh, and he was deeply moved um, by people from the fringes of society coming to faith, encountering the risen Jesus, receiving his grace and forgiveness and spirit, giving their life to the Father and to their neighbors. He was so deeply moved uh, that the second week that he was there to express his solidarity with his brothers and sisters, he got a tattoo. Um, now, Ray Jones is a middle-aged white guy that always wears khaki pants and a button-down shirt. So as he told this story, I was leaning in and he was unbuttoning his shirt like this and I was getting ready to see a big fat tattoo. And he got to like right here and he said, do you see it? And everyone leaned in and it was smaller than a dime and lighter than the hair on his arm. And we all laughed like you didn't laugh. You were supposed to laugh at that uh, because it was ambivalent, right? He wanted a tattoo. relate to that. I have for a long time wanted to get a tattoo, you know, so that I wouldn't think of myself as middle-aged as I am. But I have this problem. I can't find that one image that will capture who I think I am, that will express who I think I'm becoming, that would inspire me in the middle of ordinary life and remind me of all that's good and true and beautiful. Now, you might say to me that, well, that's because you're middle aged and you're putting way too much thought into this. But I actually think it's because our bodies matter. And the images and metaphors that we use to describe our body, that we put on our bodies, really matters. There is, as one theory goes, the thought that metaphors are the things we live by. The images we think in, the images we use in our mouths shape what we see and how we interact with it. And I was reminded of that as I prepared for this sermon today, uh, which is going to be based on John 15 verses 1 to 17. 
Um, and it is one of those passages in which Jesus gives us a master metaphor. So whether you read along or whether you listen, let me challenge you to listen well and listen carefully because this too is God's word. I am the true vine and my father is the farmer. Every branch in me that bears no fruit, he cuts off. But every branch that's bearing fruit, he cuts back so that it will bear even more fruit. You have already been cut back, cleaned, or pruned because of the word that I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear any fruit on its own unless it remains in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If anyone remains in me, he or she will bear much fruit. But if anyone does not remain in me, they will become like a branch that withers, is thrown away. Such branches are gathered up and thrown into the fire and burned. But if you if you remain in me and my words remain in you, then ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. For this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love, just as I obeyed the Father's commands and remained in His love, so too you can obey my commands and remain in my love. I have told you this so that my joy might be in you and your joy might be complete. This is my command, that you love one another just as I have loved you. No greater love has anyone than this, that they lay down their lives for their friends. I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. A servant does not know his master's business, but everything that I have learned from the Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I have appointed you to go and bear Fruit, fruit that will last. Then, then you will ask for whatever you wish in my name and the Father will give it to you. This is my command. Love one another. This is the word of the Lord. Pray with me if you would. Jesus, you came into the world full of grace and truth. You spoke to your disciples. You invited them to come and to be with you. You invited them to live with you, to live in you, to live for you, to put their trust and their hope in you. And you invite us to do the same thing, and we need your help to do that. And so we ask that you would come and you would speak to us, that you would open our ears, our hearts, our minds, and our very lives by the power of your spirit, so that we might know what it looks like to remain in you, to rest in you, and to receive from you. And so we pray this prayer as we lift up our hearts. We do it in your name, and together we say, amen. Uh, any psychology majors out there? Anybody? Yeah? I was a psychology major, uh, which means that I was prepared to do absolutely nothing when I graduated from college. Just kidding. Um, one of the things that I did as a psychology major uh, was I took a class on persuasion. Uh, it piqued my interest in metaphor and images. It was a semester long study on how governments, institutions, and individuals use images and metaphors to shape other people's thoughts, behaviors, and lives. I'd totally forgotten about all of that class until last year when I read a book called Boys in the Boat. Uh, it is a great book. I highly recommend it to you. 
Um, it's about some boys who go to college at the University of Washington during the Great Depression. They make the crew and they row themselves all the way from the University of Washington into history by winning the gold medal at the 1936 Berlin Olympics. These guys come out of nowhere and become world beaters. And it is a fantastic sports story. It is a great story about how these nobodies find themselves caught up in the Olympics and in Hitler's master plan to change Germany and change the world. Uh, it's a great story, and it's one of those stories that, you know, it inspires you on a personal level. If you're a sports fan, it reminds you of the power of sports, and then it brought back all of these issues related to propaganda, persuasion, images, and metaphors. It's an amazing exploration of how Hitler mastered metaphors to master people, to change the way they saw the world, to change the way they related to their neighbors. Hitler mastered metaphors and became the master of destruction. And that's part of the story that this book tells. And it does a great job of bringing out the tragedy of that history, of how Hitler mastered metaphors to take away life and to take away the life of the people of Israel, God's people. It was a fascinating experience to be opening that book and reading that and then be a preacher and go and open the Bible and see that on every page where there are metaphors, they're always used to give life, not to take it away, not to destroy it, but to give life to God's people and to the world. Um, metaphors in the Bible are always used and reused, worked and reworked to call people back to God, to remind them that God is the center of our lives, the one who redeems our past and opens up our future. And one of the master metaphors in all of the Bible is the image of the grapevine. It's throughout every part of Scripture. It's in the law. It's in the prophets. It's in the writings. If you are a Bible reader, you will discover it sooner or later. And Jesus and his friends, his disciples, would have discovered it and known it. And that's because they would have grown up praying psalms like Psalm 80. Listen to this prayer and listen for the metaphor of the vine. Restore us, O God. And make your face to shine upon us that we may be saved. O Lord God Almighty, how long will your anger smolder against your people? You fed them with the bread of tears. Restore us, O God Almighty. Make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. And then listen well to this. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out of the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it and it took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its boughs to the sea and its shoots as far as the rivers. The people of Israel would have prayed that prayer and in the praying of that prayer would have heard that image and would have been invited to know that they are the people of God planted in the world to bring life to a world that's full of death. They also, if they prayed that words, would have also heard the words of Isaiah the prophet who says this in chapter 5, I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes but it yielded only bad fruit. People would have prayed using the image of the vine. They would have heard the prophet's words that used the image of the vine. And had they gone to Israel, they would have seen that image as well. Josephus, who's a historian, a contemporary of Paul, tells us that the temple in Jerusalem was decorated with a golden vine 
that clusters of grapes hung around the doors, and those clusters were the size of a man. So the image, this metaphor of the vine, would have been something they prayed, something they heard, and something they saw. They would have been familiar with it. And then Jesus comes and says what? I am the true vine. I am the real vine. And you are the branches. I am the true vine and my father is the farmer. If you want to live and have life, remain in me. Now, when the disciples would have heard that, it would have been ringing bells in their ears, echoing through all of their lives. They would have heard Jesus saying, I am Israel for Israel. I'm the one for the many. And if you want to be a part of what God is doing, then come be with me. Come remain in me. Let my words remain in you. Enter into my joy. Hear my command and share with others the love I am giving to you. Because life, real life, is always about connection. I think that's really hard for us to hear. One, because we don't traffic in metaphors a lot. Most of you are probably not literature majors. We think that words like metaphors are for decoration, for extraordinary, and not for the ordinary. And let's be serious. Our culture does not encourage connection. In fact, it encourages you to think of yourself as a lone ranger, someone who can pull themselves up by their bootstraps, who can identify and solve your own problems on your own. Anyone had a problem recently that they Googled? Of course you have. Anyone had a problem that you used videos on YouTube to solve? Probably. I ride a road bike. I have to maintain it because I don't have any money because I'm a pastor. It scares my wife to death when she knows I'm watching YouTube to fix my brakes. But that's how we solve our problems. Two fastest growing retail stores in America. You know what they are? Home Depot and Lowe's. Because we like to do it ourselves. That's how we're taught to live in this country. Identify your own problems, solve your own problems, come to college to develop your capabilities so that you can go out in the world and do what? Make it on your own. And so all of our culture tells us to be on our own and to do our own thing. And it's then really hard for us to hear Jesus saying, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you want to live, remain in me. It's hard for us to hear his hard word. Without me, you can do nothing. It's hard for us to hear that. It's hard for us to believe that. It is hard for us to hear this metaphor and to live by it. So let me tell you the good news one more time. We need to hear this over and over and over again. When Jesus says that he is the vine and we are the branches, he is saying that although he was God with God before the world began, although he was great, he has become small so that he might connect himself to us, so that he might grow up among us and wrap his arms around us. The one who made all things has become one of us, so that living in love, he might draw us to himself, so that he might live with us and live for us, doing that in obedience to his Father all the way to the cross. You see, this is the mystery and the wonder of Jesus' life. That although he is the true vine and he gives life to the world, he is put to death. He comes and offers grace and we say no thank you. Jesus lives full of life as one of us and does what he commands us to do. He lays down his life for his friends. 
And he is raised from the dead so that now, no matter where we are or who we are or how far onto the fringe we have gone, we might know that in his love and in his grace, he is always connected to us. That the love that comes from the Father that we see in his life, he gives it to me and to you and to all of God's children. So that, and here's the big so that, so that receiving it, we can pass it on. Jesus says he has one command. Love one another as I have loved you. Give what you have received. And that's why every time I read this passage and the image comes to mind, I remember how inside out and upside down Jesus is. Everybody in the world lives to get and to grab, to have and to hold. This is demonstrated in a really obvious way by someone like Aristotle. Aristotle in his poetics says the greatest thing by far is to become the master of the metaphor. Become the master of the metaphor so that you can make connections with words and control other people to get from them what you want and to get them to do what you want to do. That's the way the world uses images and metaphors. And if you don't believe me, tune in on February 7th at 8 o'clock to the Super Bowl and watch our best and brightest pump out commercial after commercial that have one point to change what you do with your wallet. And this is why Jesus is radical. He is telling us not to use your words to get and to grab, not to use your life and your gifts to make yourself safe, but to offer yourself up in the same way that he has offered himself up, to stay connected to his love so that you go out and love your neighbors by laying down your life. The life of getting and grabbing, that's what the Bible calls sin. The theological tradition calls it being curved in on yourself. That is not how you were made to live. You were made to live open, receiving from God and passing that on to other people. So let me invite you not to master the metaphors or master your classes or master skills in this time and space, but instead be mastered by Jesus. Be controlled by his love. Come back to him again and again to receive and to return. And when you do, when you start to live that life of remaining, it will bear fruit. It will bring goodness to the people you live with and play with, to the people you're here with now, and you will be forever. Let's pray. God, we can only come to you and trust in you and receive from you when we see your love embodied in your son Jesus, when we see him coming into this world to give himself to us so that we might go and give our gifts to others. I pray for myself and for each person here that you would set us free from the fear, from the doubt, from the anger, that keeps us from receiving from you, from forgiving others as we have been forgiven. Teach us, I pray, to live connected to your son Jesus, open to your very life and spirit and power so that we can learn to bear fruit in a radical, countercultural, eternal way. And we pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Please stand, and I invite you to join us as together we affirm our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. 
he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 61. If you would take your hymnals and sing with me, please. Paul tells us that Jesus is the end of the law, the one who fulfills it, who makes it a gift, so that we find in obedience to Jesus and the law, joy. That only and always starts when we first receive God's blessing. So may you receive that even now and even here. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and those you love, both now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace.